Hey, Derek. Hello, friend. I'm just, I'm just sorting out my, my um. Hang on, hang on. I'm just sorting out my headphones. Okay. Do you know if your video is able to show? My my video, I should be all right. Uh, let me see. Share screen. Is that what I want to do? No video. Just uh, just uh, oh, click on the at the bottom left on the video yeah. icon. Allow Zoom to share your screen. Yes. Not okay. Open. Should be. No, no, no. Uh, at the bottom left, there is a. Oh, uh, start video. Okay, start I see video. it. Yeah, oh, yeah. brilliant! I see it. Uh, yeah. How are you mm -hmm. doing, Derek? Ah, okay. I uh, look. Uh, let me just. <laughs> it's all right. Out. Take your time. Hey, I see an, an old friend, Eric. How are you doing? Fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, Derek. We we oh, still good. admitting a oh. part, we're still admitting a participant. So um, mm -hmm. while we are waiting, I mean, I can ask you a thing or two. How are you doing? All right, all right. Where are you all where right. are you at, at the moment? I'm in Portugal. You're in Portugal, all right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What time uh, is it there right now? It's one o'clock. No, it's ten. It's ten. Ah, it's, Portugal is on GMT. It, well, it's on WET, which I found out last night was Western European time. So, um, <laughs> yeah, Portugal and, and England are at the same time at the moment. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. That's, so. that's brilliant. It's, um, it's a great honor, uh, my friend, that you are uh, able to to talk to us today. And I'm, I'm sure quite a number of my colleagues are going to be listening in. Uh, so just have your coffee and relax and uh, I'll let you know when we start. And okay, you, know, you, can, you can tell me about your most recent adventures. Well, um, I don't have, I haven't had many adventures since <laughs> March, of course. <laughs> right. the, um, yeah. I I was I should really at this time be in um, Mozambique working on a project for the Liverpool school right but um they cancelled the project uh even though they had money uh, they they blamed covid oh, is this the essentials project uh yes yeah 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 okay, yeah okay. yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. and they they blamed covid but it wasn't covid that that they because the project um i think is now going ahead in malawi oh really malawi. yeah <laughs> yes yeah put it this way they're building experimental huts in malawi and the job that i was supposed to do was to build experimental huts and see the effect of different kinds of nets on uh, mosquito behavior so right. the implication is and it's only about a 150 kilometers away from where the, the the site in mozambique was because of course mozambique and malawi are right next to each other at the top so brilliant yeah no, that's nice. That's nice. When when is the last time you were in Tanzania? You were in the north not long ago. Yeah, I I was in I worked in Malaba, um, right. until from fourteen to sixteen, I think. Ah, huh. you know Malaba and Kagera. I I haven't been there in Paso. It's very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. 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 It's very nice. I liked it very much. And the, and there's the a climb. colleague of ours I joining today, Nancy. I think she's she works a little up there occasionally. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. so it's good. you. You have it, it, Mwanza, which is where now uh, London School is running a 
the equivalent trial to the one that they did in Muleba. Correct. With, um, but Moanda doesn't get the rain that Muleba gets. <laughs> Yeah. So, so in Muleba, it gets rain more or less the whole year. So it's very green. And, and when it rains, it's not, <clears throat> it's only occasionally like the rain that comes in the wet season in Ifakara. I mean, mm -hmm. in Ifakara, it can rain all day, all day. And yeah. you really can't do very much. Whereas in Muleba, it rarely does that. It rains for, you know, maybe 40 minutes, very hard. And then the it sun stops. comes out yeah. and everything's washed clean. And it's nice. It's nice. I like Malaba yeah. very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, need, I need to make time and go up there. Um, uh, the, they, they still have a lot of Anopheles Gambias yes, up there. Well, the, um, our our trial got got rid of most of the SS in the, in our and our, in the area where we worked. Good point. Um, and they and it went from being eighty percent Gambi, twenty percent Arabiensis, to something like seventy percent Arabiensis, and a diminishing thirty percent of Gambi. Yeah. Um, At least you still have Gambi there, no? You still have it, it, I, I I presume so in in small numbers, but I I mean that <clears throat> things change. Yeah, and and I mean it's one of the conundrums of East African medical entomology is that this gam the decline that we saw in Gambi from maybe the year two thousand onwards. Before, right. before any large-scale intervention, was <clears throat> nobody really knows why, I don't think. I didn't know about <clears throat> that. I thought most of the reduction was coincident with ITNs. No, 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 no. Oh, no. oh okay. No, okay. No. I, I'll send you a, a, a graph. Well, maybe it's even on... There, there, there might be a paper in Peer J called some like it hot some I like it wet yeah, yeah I, I know no, no, this. some like it wet and there's yeah. some like it hot some okay. like it hot it is about the the thermal responses of both gambi and Fonestus in mozambique in favela and in favela before there was any large-scale intervention basically the gambi more or less disappeared Ah. And, and, and this was taking place at the same time as it happened in, um, in, in, in Tanzania. So, uh, uh, so there was a big, big, huge, long, you know, few thousand kilometers of, of, of distribution. We still don't know why it was. Um, mm. Mm. It, 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 it why? Don't know. Have no idea. It, it, it's not the temperature because that didn't make much difference. And in favela, it wasn't the introduction of many, many houses with tin roofs, mm -hmm. which I think makes a difference. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of improving housing as a way of reducing malaria transmission. Um, yeah, I'm, hope, I'm hoping we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. But I mean, mm -hmm. Derek, first of all, this 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 um, Anopheles Gambit decline. Um, what do you think was the contribution of ITNs uh, to it? To, was there any, or do you think it was all climate based? No, no. I, 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 uh, ITNs certainly um, probably contributed and maintain that kind of effect. But let's say um, the TB, Correct. In, not TB today, but TB at the, at the beginning, end of, beginning of the 1900s, declined before there was adequate treatment. 
Yeah, I read about this uh, McNaughton thesis <clears throat> and uh, Thomas McNaughton, a British uh, 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 specialist who argued that it was not about treatment at all. It, it, well, treatment helped when it was going down, but it was, in fact, improved lifestyle, perhaps, that, that was the, 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 the key factor. And the, may, the, the same thing might be happening or might have happened with the Gambi in the sense that it, it went down. We don't know why. And I, I say, <clears throat> in, in Favela, there was no particular climatic characteristic that, that you could identify as, as being responsible for the decline in, in Gambi. Wow. But at the same time, at the start of our work, Funestus, which was by far the main vector in, in Mozambique, in Favela, um, was really quite a seasonal mosquito. Had nice peaks and... Tr and then um, in the last few years of the, the work that we did there, there was no seasonality. The, the mosquito was, was, was sort of always present and it was present always at very high densities, sort of the mean number that we collected per house, I think certainly uh, uh, in, in one year was something like 70 a night in a light trap right. every, night, every night of the year. <laughs> that, that's 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 a lot. Of, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of mosquitoes. Mm. For a vector like Anopheles funestus, that explains uh, why you have uh, uh, such high burden in places like uh, uh, in those parts of Mozambique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Derek, way, uh, I think that we the, have. Uh, go ahead. By the way, I'm not a professor, you know. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I take that, but before this, I, I sent a note to my colleagues and say that um, they should expect uh, quite a lot of modesty because we were trying to find a bio, a bio sketch of yours. Yes. We were trying to find some kind of a description of Derek Charlwood. And then there's very little except uh, what Marcel Tana wrote on the forward of your book. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think everybody. Um, knows about your work so we are all very excited about that and, and thank you very much for taking mm -hmm. time and we have mm -hmm. a number of questions for you Derek so uh, again no rush but we just want to have a, a discussion and, and listen in and, and mm -hmm. try and get if you like suction a little bit of what, what's between your ears. Okay well I've had my coffee so that can <laughs> wake me up a bit. Mm and digitize it so um, mm -hmm. just, just just let us go and I think that today also we have a number of uh, my colleagues from Ifakara Health Institute joining and we are lucky also that we have a cohort of friends uh, from Kenya from the Kenya Medical Research Institute mm -hmm. um, uh, people like Eric Ochomo, Dr. Luna Kamau I think uh, they are on the call today which is uh, fantastic uh, uh, um, opportunity again. So I will ask you a number of questions. We'll do that, but at the end, my colleagues will also send some <coughs> questions by chat. And again, we're going to take it as slow as possible, uh, really on your scale. Sure, um, sure. I'm, and, I'm, I'm, I'm here all day. So. <laughs> <laughs> we don't Thanks. do very much in Mos in Portugal at the moment with COVID. So um, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this is. Um, uh, Derek, I would like us to begin in 1988. Um, you arrived in Tanzania uh, to work as the entomologist of the first African, mal first malaria vaccine to be tested in Africa. This is the Colombian vaccine, uh, mm -hmm. Pataroyo, mm -hmm. Pataroyo's vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the mood like at the time? Um, what were people thinking of medical entomology? Um, what is the view of uh, public health officials working when a vaccine seemed to be on the horizon. What was the mood? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I think that the, 
the the mood in Ifakara anyway amongst the people who were trying to test the the vaccine was not oh this is going to cure malaria uh, i think many people were well this really does need um testing because as with many things and particularly then rather than perhaps now um there were a number of claims about the vaccine that came out from Colombia uh, and Pateroyo's lab that would, were kind of difficult to verify. So the, the, the vaccine trial in, in Ifakara was seen very much as, well, it's our job to see whether or not it works or not. <clears throat> I mean, that's the, the whole essence of science anyway. Uh, that you should try and, and test it, disprove something rather than prove it, if you like. Um, so yeah, we we it, it, it was, but it but we we had a, a good team um, in in Ifakara, both doing the work on the on the ground and doing the analysis. Of, and, and setting up the, the, the proper trial. So you had, um, you know, many people were involved. The, the director at the time, uh, as you know, probably was Andrew Ketua, who, right. who um, w was, was a, a malariologist or, or a medical doctor as well. Um, and, and it was a question of, well, let's, let's do it and see, see if it works. Um, and yeah. the fact that it didn't really work is okay, but um, that, that's, that's, that's how it was. And uh, I was actually quite uh, sensible in the, in the malaria vaccine trial because I tend to be interested in changing things. So if I start off an experiment, I often realize that I'm going down the wrong path. And rather than go down that wrong path until I get <clears throat> enough results to show that I've gone down the wrong path, I might perhaps um, try and alter the direction slightly, which makes a lot of my work right. much more difficult to, to um, interpret. Whereas <laughs> with, the, with the vaccine trial, it, it really did not take very long to determine what entomology was needed oh, yeah. and then we had the team do it and uh, i didn't really mess around very much with the with the with the vaccine trial i just it's, it's, sort of set up the trial and followed it followed it and mm. derek you trained with the great uh, mick gillis um yeah um, I, I would have wished to have met this guy. Uh, you had the, the honor to not just meet him, but also train with him. Uh, what was the main interest for you on medical entomology and on mosquitoes and studying an Uh Well, um, the, my, my, uh, my PhD was on the, the mating behavior of the Anopheles Gambi complex. The idea was that um, there had been a, a trial of sterile males in, in Africa in which the males were produced by hybrid crossing. They were hybrids. And there was the, 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 the trial failed due to assortative mating. Um, and so the the idea was well why is it what was the what was the what was what's the problem what what actually keeps <coughs> the, the these these sympatric members of the of the gambi complex apart right um so i really um was was looking at the the various aspects of their of their mating behavior which was which was not something that that gillies was particularly involved in i think anything that i learned from gillies i 
kind of imbibed by osmosis. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and also, um, I have to say very much, Gillies uh, w w was, was obviously the leader, and he would sometimes come out of his office smoking his, his pipe, his kashimbu, um, and stand there and say very slowly, I, I think today you can call me the leader. And then he'd have a suck on his pipe and go back into the into his office. <laughs> but but it, it, he he was, was the, the, there was another member of the of the of, of the team, and that was Tony Wilkes. And right. Tony Wilkes was very much the the practical man, and um, the the kind of uh, common sense sort of person who might have mentioned. Uh, had a word or two and then Gillies would ruminate and and design an experiment that was based on their mutual ideas uh -huh. god so, rest um, his soul in peace uh, tony wilkes um, yeah 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 he was a very nice man of course um yes. uh, as well so um i i, I learned both from from gillies uh, and from 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 tony as well because un unfortunately, because the work that, uh, I mean, I think that the, 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 at the time that I was doing my PhD, Gillies was working in the Gambia. Uh, but I think his best work had been done in Tanzania when he was um, working down in Muheza. Uh, but that work wasn't actually, my, my, my PhD wasn't relevant to that piece of work, so I really didn't didn't uh, yeah. read it or know anything about it very much. <laughs> I I did not realize yes. how important Gillies was. You know, I was just there. He was there. You know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> um, it was only when I was in Brazil and I started doing similar kinds of field work that. I, I realized, oh, look, it all, all roads lead to the Gillies and Wilkes. Back to Gillies and Wilkes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, so then I, so so, I managed. Mm -hmm. Sorry, carry on. No, no, go, go ahead. I mean, I just, you brought up Brazil and perfect. I, I, I want us to go there. I mean, you, you have, you're one of the few entomologists who has had um, the opportunity to work uh, and the ability to work in Africa, in Asia in the Americas, I'd actually lived with the communities there. Uh, and you refer now to your work in Brazil and the realization that all roads lead back to Gillies and Wilkes. Uh, in Brazil, <coughs> you have this interesting story of uh, mosquitoes coming in from Dakar, um, um, at that time called Anopheles Gambi, but later realized Anopheles Gambiensis. Do mm -hmm. you think this is something, so whatever the Brazilians did by 1942, they have eliminated this. Do you think this is something that is possible in any other country? Do you have any idea of the places you've worked where this could be done? Uh, um, the the uh, Eritrea has perhaps the, the greatest chance of, of doing something like this. Um, because there you have Arabiensis as the main vector, the only vector, uh, and it's 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 hot. It's a, it's not really the same as Brazil because in the northeast of Brazil, where it where it arrived and around Natal and and Pernambuco and up there, then indeed it's not too different to Eritrea. Very hot and dry. But once it starts going up, and, and in the 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 hill Juaguarabi is is uh, it's it's wetter. Um, but uh, the reason why the many of the earlier control um, programs seem to succeed or succeeded is not necessarily going to be so easy these days um, because the 
the way that it was done was it was basically an, an army of people involved who had no choice um i don't know if you know <laughs> the, the fred soper who, right. who who was responsible for getting rid of arabiensis in um in brazil kind of was was extremely rigid in the way that he worked and and you know you're five minutes late for work you you're out on your ear um it, it's the same with with it was the same in in sao tome where they very nearly eliminated malaria in the 60s and uh, early 70s i think it was um that by by the ddt residual spraying and the use of of chloroquine prophylaxis uh you know people if if there was a a spray man who was on holiday from principe in sao tome and the and the boss in sao tome saw him even though he was on legitimate holiday he was kind of drafted in to work in sao tome um, oh really <laughs> yes <laughs> So it was. It, it's it's one of these things where the it, I, I mean I discussed this a little bit with 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 Bart Knowles that the 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 rise of of democracy makes it a little bit more difficult to undertake um, large scale campaigns like this uh, in, in the same way that <clears throat> these days you have people who you may have. Uh, a vaccine that works against a particular disease let's say it's yellow fever and supposing there was a, a yellow fever outbreak in the uh, the states there would still uh, and we know we have a vaccine that is a hundred percent effective but there would still be lots of people who would say oh no no you can't vaccinate me it's going against my rights and this right. sort of thing and so you might then maintain the disease um so but if, if you're asking me which countries you could do this in then it would be the peripheral countries where transmission uh, isn't that high um the edges uh i say eritrea is the one country that i know that you could do that in uh, right in sao tome uh, as well but of course in brazil it was not too difficult to find the breeding sites of the mosquitoes and it was uh, i think it was paris green that they used to, to treat yeah. tr to treat all the all the breeding sites uh, in some places finding the breeding sites is not that easy we talked about Muleba before before everybody else came on um and hello everybody um uh, it was very difficult to find the places where Gambi was breeding. And I suspect that it was because it was, you tend to think of Gambi as being, oh, it, it will breed in puddles close to houses. Right. But if there are no clo puddles close to houses, but the, the particular breeding sites are a kilometer or two away, then maybe right. they'll, they'll fly a kilometer to, um, to, to oviposit. And in, in Muleba, then that means flying to areas close to the lake. And they were very, very hard to get to. Really, very yeah. hard. So, so uh, yeah. one, one, one vector species that is equally or even more difficult to find in the aquatic stages is Anopheles funestus, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, uh, uh, that that brings me actually to our next question i mean you worked on this vector a lot as well both in mozambique and in tanzania and yet uh, for most entomologists um, unfortunately even in the eastern southern africa it is still a fairly neglected vector why do you think this is the case well uh probably because it was so difficult to um, colonize it uh, there's there's a number of reasons one is and and this is a, a kind of a conundrum that is still 
there are many things that remain that I, I really have no idea about. But when they did the first kind of spray rounds in Africa with DDT, Funestus more or less disappeared. And it was even thought at some time that the only place they'd find them was in museums. Uh, and, and after um, the spraying stopped, it took a long time for Fenestus to reappear. Uh, and, and people didn't really know why, and I still don't know why, because the spread of resistance in Fenestus seems to be very rapid, implying that there's a lot of genetic exchange between them. But I, I imagine that it, it's, it's neglected because not that many people spend their time in the field these days. A lot of entomologists like to work in the laboratory and Fenestus <laughs> remains very difficult to, um, to colonize. And so uh, you, you work with what you've got and you, you, you can't get good chromosomes from Fenestus. And the, the, I mean, you have to be very, very good to be able to get them, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you have to be very, very good to get them from Gambi as well. But, <laughs> you know, that's my, <laughs> only my... <laughs> but I mean, this is, a, this is a, isn't this unfortunate for a vector that is otherwise so incredibly good at transmitting? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Phrenestus is the, is, is, um, the, 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 the most anthropophilic mosquito around. Uh, it, it really loves people and it loves biting indoors. So perhaps again, people have neglected finesse because you can think, well, you know, you spray perhaps, or you use um, LLINs and your problem with finesse goes away. And, it, and to be fair, it largely does, I think. So, you know, it's, it's uh, but, uh, yeah. I have a soft spot for ne for Finestus. I like Finestus, of course. Uh, yeah, De Derek, uh, you. I want us to go back to Gillis, and um, in one in my previous exchanges with you, you have always emphasized this point that young entomologists need to read the works <laughs> by uh, Gillis and uh, and uh, Dr. Botha de Melion, uh, the great South African uh, entomologist. Uh, and also the work by uh, uh, Dr. Gillis and uh, Maureen Kotze, uh, Professor Kotze, uh, whom mm -hmm. I hope to speak to at some point. Mm -hmm. what, what makes these two books particularly special? Um, why do you recommend them? I mean, they, we don't even have good copies for them, but they, <laughs> they seem to be great. Oh, you don't have good copies? Oh dear, that's a shame. Um, <laughs> That's a shame. Well, because the, 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 there's one thing coming back to, the, to Gillies and his papers uh, and, and most of the, the scientific papers of that era in the, the late 60s, 70s, 80s, let's say. Uh, and it's something that, that people should always try and remember. And that is that he was, he was very careful to always point out what his results showed, not what they might show, not what, what might be the result of this, not, not to speculate too much, rather than just, and, and I think there's a, there's a tendency to, um, to kind of beat the drum a lot more these days than they used to be in the past. I think in the past, People said, I mean, Gillies used to say, well, we, he quote, I think from, I think it's a quote from the Bible, you know, we spread our, our bread upon the waters to see what will happen with it. Um, so that when we're not um, advocates necessarily for um, new, too, too much of our, our own um, research. We do it 
and then we see what you know what the results mean so let's say when he did his big uh, mark release experiment in Moheza, he he marked you know 300,000 mosquitoes with with dots of paint on them this sort of thing and and got a, a, a good idea of the flight range of the Gambi that he was working with. But he was careful enough to say, this was the flight range at this time in this place. It doesn't mean that that's going to be always the flight range everywhere. The, sorry, the flight range is likely to be as much a, a, a factor of the environment as it is of the mosquito. But these days, you know, you might pick up a review and it will always say, oh, the flight range of Anopheles Gambi is X, and based on <laughs> Gilly's work. Well, was, he was saying, no, 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 it's not that. It's that in this kind of environment, it was that. Uh, yeah. Elsewhere, it might be different. Like in the Kilombero, it might be much further because the, there's big areas where there are from the river to the to the villages where the, where there's nothing for the mosquitoes to eat uh, and in the villages there may be nowhere for the mosquitoes to lay their eggs so yeah. you may get a a, a a a different scenario but the these two books uh, the, the 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 biology of the mosquito won't have changed that much and in the I don't suggest that you read the whole of these are these are taxonomy books, but they certainly give very comprehensive reviews of the work that has been done up to that period in time. So the, the work that was done by the very early entomologists uh, who, of course, weren't in the position to distinguish between the, the different all the different members of the Gamby complex. Right, yeah. They but, still call it species A, species B. Uh, that's time. right. They, they, were, they, were beginning to, they were beginning to separate them like that. But at the same time, um, you know, they, 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 there was a lot of ecological work that was done in the early days that really has been let go in, mm -hmm. in, in recent years. This is, I think, because of, of what um, Harrison, the man who wrote the book, Man, Mosquitoes and Malaria, mm -hmm. uh, he, he called the spray gun war. The spray gun war. Yes. The, the, the idea is that you know, prior to the introduction of DDT, the, the, there was the idea that ecological methods changing breeding sites um, modifying the the environment would reduce numbers of mosquitoes but once you had ddt and you almost eliminated the mosquito then you didn't need to study these other things but again in the 1950s when the who initiated the um the malaria eradication program, the idea was that IRS would only be done for maybe four, five years at most. And after that, other techniques would come into play because right. of resistance. It was already so, known that. It, it was not, it was feared. It was feared. Okay. It was there was some resistance in some insects, but the idea was that if you if you put an insecticide in the environment, you will get resistance developing because the the mosquitoes have a a, a high turnover. Right. They, uh, so you you know there will be probably one or two mutations in a very large population that that confer resistance to the insecticide that you're using. And that very quickly that that mosquito will supplant the others. It's yeah. what happens. Um, Eric, uh, one point you raised here that I just want us to emphasize, so also for my own benefit and the benefit of my colleagues, is the modesty in the old entomologists. And you, you have this too in your work, uh, the idea that you should not um, 
oversell your work, but really just state the facts. Now, you could make an inference, but um, I think that is a, a fairly powerful uh, uh, approach uh, to do. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's also, it, it's, it's not necessarily modesty. Um, it, it, it's, I, I think people were quite proud of what they did, but it's a question of realizing uh, the limits and, right. and what, they, what they don't know rather than what they do know. Um, right. So I, 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 the other thing, of course, about the, the Gillies' work and his papers is how well they are written. They are really <laughs> yes. written extremely, they're extremely well written. Um, and the statistics are extremely simple. Well, of course, no, <laughs> no computers, no computers. But, but the, statistics, the statistics are still valid yeah, in general. Yeah, that's the point, that's the point. In yeah. general, you know, that you, I, I, I think that my own personal career has been hampered by the fact that I am, um, uh, I'm, I'm not very good at statistics. I, I, I actually uh, uh, am more or less unable to, to read uh, 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 an equation. I find it very difficult. It's a genetic oh. thing, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Derek. Um, I mean, we talked a lot about um, uh, Dr. Gillies and uh, and Wilkes. They're, they're, you mean you agree mostly with them? But this one bit of information that, from my exchanges with you, I learned that you slightly disagree, uh, and this is what I, I, I call the sack problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, y y this is your only disagreement uh, with with Gillies and Wilkes' work. Uh, on how they interpreted the mosquito feeding frequencies. Um, it, talk, to, talk to me about this as if I was, you know, a, a non-entomologist. I think it's a very important point, but, yeah. Well, it, it, you see the, the diagram that you've, you've put up there. Um, right. the, 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 the question becomes, once an, uh, an, an egg, uh, a, a follicle, once a mosquito takes a blood meal, the egg develops and it starts off from being, let's say, the size of a pea to the size of a banana. And mm -hmm. a, as a result, the sheath in which holds the egg before it goes into the lateral oviduct to be laid increases in size. And once the egg is laid, this sheath then becomes what is called a sac. The sac, though, gradually decreases in size. It shrinks back down to the epithelium of the, of the um, lateral oviduct at, over time. And it's, and it's thought that this, this is a temperature dependent process because mm -hmm. of course all 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 processes in in the mosquito are basically temperature dependent um and it's that the the it takes uh, at tropical temperatures it takes about um 24 hours for the sac to to shrink, to shrink. Mm -hmm. now the only thing uh, uh, and then then the thing that's wrong with that diagram that you see there from the, or, or it, uh, it, it is your number H in that particular, I'm presuming everybody can see this, you see. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, I hope that, so. That, 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 it, that, that it, what used to be thought that the sac, each sac would then end up as a dilatation. Okay, uh, there would be these, a different sac these, for these, the next dilatation. And you have another sac, for the next dilatation. <clears throat> That's not quite how it works. The, the, if an egg is laid, all information about previous ovipositions, if, if they're, they, w disappears, um, so that a mosquito that lays eggs uh, or a follicle that, that results in 
uh, an ovarial that results in producing a, a follicle and lays an egg then means that all you can see from that particular uh, system is that it is porous, not that how many times it has laid eggs. The only way you will see whether a mosquito has not laid it has how old it is and if it's not laid it is if it if that particular ovarial has not developed an egg during that cycle mm -hmm. so that you will see uh, a, a, a relic as a result of a non-developed egg so that let's say when i was in um, papua new guinea mm -hmm. i i found the only way that i could identify how old a mosquito was and i think that tony wilts also did this was to look at what are called dwarf ovarials um that that do not and never do develop eggs because the ovarial is the ovary is packed with right. ovarials mm -hmm. and some of these are kind of squeezed so much that they they don't have room to develop and they never have room to develop and so they they go through the cycle but it's um a bit of a waste of time really for them they just uh so the, the eggs don't come out the, no they don't develop eggs and the eggs then uh degenerate what what little there was degenerates yeah. into a into a relic but the sac you you say my only disagreement yes the only disagreement i had with with tony and 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 gilly's work and and i'm still not sure <laughs> who's right of course was that they suggested that at higher temperatures fenestus the eggs developed in two days but the mosquito spent a day before returning to feed so that the sac had shrunk uh, was shrunken and and the, the 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 there was no evidence of any sac left so oh if there's no sac you know that the mosquito did not return to feed that night and then they said well when it's cooler it takes three days for the insect to develop the eggs mm -hmm. but it returns with sacs and so uh, the whole cycle the oviposition cycle takes three days whatever uh, hot temperatures two days to lay the eggs to develop the eggs one day to rest between laying and returning to feed and in cooler temperatures three days to develop the eggs but to return immediately and i i just uh, I, th I believe that what happened at the higher temperature was that the sac shrank much faster than they thought. And so, therefore, the mosquito returned to feed the same night. And Fronestus, certainly in Tanzania at the time that they were doing the work, would be feeding very late at night maybe at right. four o'clock in the morning was the peak time of feeding. So it would have already had 12 hours between for the um, sac to constrict, uh, yeah. for, for a considerable time for the, for the sac to, to, to contract. And that that may well have been a sufficient time and a sufficient temperature for the sac to contract and the mosquito to return after two days. So yeah. uh, I don't know. That's, this is a, this is a, a pretty technical uh, um, uh, subject, but I think it's an important one, uh, Derek. And many times, so actually, my, our next question to you is related to this, which is, so so I am catching mosquitoes, you know, sitting there, I'm looking for host-seeking mosquitoes, and I catch one mosquito, uh, upon dissection, I get that it has a distinctly large suck. Mm -hmm. How old, uh, how long ago did this mosquito blood feed? How long ago it blood fed? Now that's, that, <laughs> you, can, you can tell how long ago it laid its eggs. Uh -huh. uh, and as, as, as Nico has just said on a, on a, a message, it yes. could imply 
that if there is no sac, that it's laying its eggs some distance away. Correct. Um, uh, which is something that we, I, I think, may have happened in Ghana when we, when we did this in Ghana. Yes. Um, but how long ago it fed? Ah, well, that's a different question. You don't know. So we cannot tell the feeding frequencies based just on the, on the sac, but we can tell the oviposition frequencies. And you are saying these are not the same thing. Uh, well, yes, you can't tell how, it, you can tell that if it comes with the sac, you can tell that it, it feeds immediately after oviposition. But let's Correct. say, that, as I mentioned just a minute ago, it, it depends on temperature, how long ago the mosquito blood fed. If it's in the cool season, it would have blood fed maybe three days ago because you know that it takes three days for the mosquito to develop eggs. But if it's the hot season, it probably fed two days ago. Uh, so it's, it's, <coughs> it, it, it's it, it, again, it, in a way, every system is unique. Come. Many of them share the same characteristics, but not all of them do. Uh, the, the, a mosquito that is in Europe, let's say, right. yeah. uh, Ochlorotatus cantans, that used to be called <laughs> Edis cantans. Edis cantans. <laughs> um, that might take uh, weeks to find a host. Yeah, that's, that's the point uh, Nico is making. I mean, mm -hmm. the distance is quite far away, and so they turn and there's no sack. <coughs> no, that's the sack. Now, it might take a long time for it to find a host in the first place. <laughs> the, 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 you could find in, in, with Cantans, there was one uh, emergence in April, and this mosquito was what's called a univoltine mosquito one generation a year so uh, it would lay eggs with a very much longer cycle the cycle would be several weeks um, ah, okay. but you could still catch them coming to feed on you with sacks but in september you could still find nulliparous mosquitoes <laughs> so okay. these mosquitoes have been hanging around and not not being able to feed but in in the tropics it's not like that in the tropics it's it's get everything done as quickly as you possibly can um, right. yeah. there's no no point in 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 the mosquito staying alive the mosquito wants to um have as many babies as it can so it it, it lays eggs as as often as it That's, can yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Um, this is, a, like I said earlier, quite, quite a technical subject, but a, a very, very important one. And there's, there'll probably be one or two additional questions around that. I want us to round off um, on the, the point about dissections. And the way I want us to round off that is by asking you, uh, and this, this diagram, most of these are from your book, actually. They're from your previous publications and a good collection mm -hmm. of them. A, a mm -hmm. few are borrowed from others, uh, mm -hmm. but mostly it's from a gen several of your publications. Uh, generally, when we bring mosquitoes to the lab and dissect it, usually we ask one question. We are just like, okay, are they parasonally <coughs> mm -hmm. But reading your work, it appears to me that you almost always did the whole picture. So you never you were never just dissecting for uh, for uh, uh, insemination. You were always looking at insemination and also at parity and the sac and the plug and at the same time. Once once you put the mosquito under the knife, you looked at the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not common practice now, but what I really would like to you to help us with is a, a simplified interpretation of what you see when the mosquito is under the knife? Well, you, you, what, when you dissect the mosquito, you, you need transmitted light. So the light comes underneath the, um, the mosquito stage so that you can, the light is coming through the preparation. And many of these things 
are really quite easy to see. Uh, a, a young, when you, when you pull out the ovaries and the, the reproductive system of the mosquito, you can very quickly tell whether this is a very young mosquito or indeed a mosquito that may be late stage nulliparous or parous, just purely by the, the size of the ovaries and the amount of tracheal kind of garbage that there is in the ovary. So that if the, if the ovary is more or less completely uh, enfolded and you can hardly see any ovarial because of all the trachea, then you know that this is a, a young mosquito. The, right. the, then the question becomes, are these mosquitoes feeding before they mate or are they feeding after they mate? If they feed before they mate, then that blood meal will not lead to the development of eggs. Mm -hmm. Is so, that a common uh, thing? Sorry for uh, interruption. Is uh, that common? Well, well, in Gambia, it's about 50% uh, are coming as, as virgins. Uh, I'd have to look at what, I, I mean, I think I'm, I think I, indeed I'm about the only person that ever bothers to look at this, but I, <laughs> I, 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 I do sort of think that the, the behavior in the first oviposition cycle is important because it's different to the rest of the, uh, of the other cycles. Um, so both Gambi and Funestus will take meals as, as virgins. And in, in, where was it? In Saint Tomé, we found that, that the, the Gambi there, which is Anopheles Caluzzi, that Throughout the year, the smaller half of the mosquito population, emerging female mosquitoes, took a blood meal before they mated, whereas the the larger mosquitoes mated before they um, fed. So it's perhaps something to do with the reserves that the mosquito has when it when it, it emerges, because once they fed the disadvantage that the mosquito has for being small seems to be lost. Okay. So I, we're interested in saying, yeah, what do these mosquitoes do in their first cycle? Are they, are they coming as a virgin? Are they mated? If they came as a virgin and now they're coming at a second time, then you can see also in their stomach, that they've got an old, the remains of an old blood meal. And this blood meal, it, it, there's again a question, does this initial blood meal, if, it's, if the mosquito is feeding on a, a host that may have gametocytes, will that result in the mosquito becoming infected or, or not? And if it's not, then the, this initial blood meal is, is, is less important. Yeah. And I, I suspect it's not because the mosquito has to get rid of a lot of the, 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 the blood meal in order to be able to, the following day, fly sufficiently well in order to, to find a mate, uh, which means flying up into a swarm. Uh, and if they're still full of blood, then you know they can hardly hardly yeah. reach the wall. Um, again, yeah. So you can. So that's an that whole thing of what they're doing in their in their first overposition cycle. I think is quite interesting. Where it tells you a little bit about where the mosquitoes might be mating as well. Right. Right. Um, all, all these sorts of things. If yeah. they, if they um, have uh, relics, then you can, if they're porous, in other words, you can see, yes, do they have sacs or no sacs? And as we just discussed, the yeah. sac, the presence of a sac implies that the mosquitoes are coming immediately to, um, to return to seek a host. If they don't have sacs, then maybe they are, taking a, 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 
a, a sugar meal in between coming to, to coming to feed and right. and in in um in mozambique we found that there was a, a relationship between where if a mosquito had oocysts it was more likely to not have sacs when it returned to feed implying uh, that it that the oocyst was developed was, was again i don't want to take too i don't want to expand on what I think I know or don't know, but it, it, would, <laughs> it, 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 it implied that the mosquitoes were taking a sugar meal between laying eggs and returning to feed. And indeed, somebody found out later on that this was seemed to be the case in the lab, that, that an oocyst infected mosquito is more likely to, that, that, that perhaps overposition is more likely to take more out of it. Right. And that it needs a, 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 a rest before returning. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, so again, that how the effect of the parasite on the on the mosquito. There's a, a lot of subtle effects that we don't yeah. really know. One so, way. I mean, is, the, oh, sorry, Derek, go ahead. No, yeah, I'll just say one way is to 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 do this kind of dissection, and at the same time look at the infection in the mosquito. Right. This is really, really appreciated, Derek. Thank you so much for uh, um, for that explanation uh, on on how we should be interpreting this. Uh, one of my colleagues on on the call just posed a question there, which mm -hmm. which which I mean, I'm tempted to bring you back just to clear this. Um, and I think it stems from your from the the slide we had earlier here. And and the, Eric is asking whether dilatations therefore. Are, are they agreeable or not as a method of age grading? Oh, uh, or, yeah. or should we do that only when we look at dwarf over dwarf ovarials? Uh, uh, certainly, in 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 Papua New Guinea, I think that I only found uh, a reliable indicator of age with dwarf ovarials. Uh, I I'm not I I never really had the chance to discuss this properly with with tony um but of course there is another thing about finding uh, relics that and it's a lot easier to find relics in mosquitoes that have ovaries at stage three in other words from resting mosquitoes not from host seeking mosquitoes Wow. And and D D Wilkes, of course, did most of his dissections on mosquitoes that have been caught resting. I did most of my dissections on mosquitoes that were were uh, attempting to feed. So there's there's a slight difference there. Um, if you get if you have a, a mosquito that's got stage three ovarios, then you very quickly can find the ones that are not developing. Mm -hmm. If you have a, an, an unfed mosquito, then you've got to look through the whole, whole ovary um, to find any, any indication of age. And, you know, I, yeah. I the, the problem is with, with the dissection is very slow. I know, and and I mean, and we we are discussing a lot now about mosquito collection methods, CDC light traps. Sorry, Derek, I, I disconnect. I, I interrupted you, but many people now use CDC light traps indoors. Very rarely do people use other methods, um, uh, resting catches. But from what you're saying, it matters the sampling method you begin with, right? If you're going to dissect them, yeah. Yeah, it, it 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 just makes it easier or more difficult. That's all. I mean, the, if you've got if you've got a blood-fed mosquito, then of course the problem is that it's very easy to puncture the stomach, and you get a slide full of blood, which doesn't help you in any yeah. way. Um, so, thank you. Uh, that that's that's the the, the thing. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I, I want us to move a little further, and at the risk of embarrassing it, myself and yourself, uh, uh, we got we got a, a, a nice uh, looking Derek there. Uh, 
Um, uh, Derek, you practice a very different form of medical entomology. Um, uh, it's almost like anthropology plus entomology together. You almost always live inside the villages uh, where you work. You, you, you must immerse yourself into the society. You live with people. You understand them. And many other entomologists don't do this. Um, and I want you to just talk to us a little bit about why you find this approach much better than other words. Uh, well, <laughs> apologies for any embarrassment if you put that out there. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. I like it. I think it's important to try and understand. Uh, much of the work that I do and have done has been what you might call pure research, not necessarily uh, applied research. Uh, it's not always been involved in trying to work out a way of, of control, controlling the mosquito. But I think if you want to work out a way of trying to control the mosquito, then you can't do it without involving the people who are being affected by the, 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 the the disease and the only way you can really understand or hope to understand whether or not the um the the the, the technique is is has a chance of success is to um is to see what it's like yourself uh yeah no i i like living in these places that's <laughs> what it is really i i yeah. find it's 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 fun uh, and I, you've done this in a in a Asia, you've done this in Latin America, you've done this in Africa, you've always lived in the villages, spoken the local languages. Well, I don't speak very much uh, uh, Machua or Bitonga, so I don't speak very much in, in, in Mozambique, but sure, the culture is important and language is culture, uh, so it's, it helps, of course. Uh, yeah, okay. Absolutely, I I I think it's a, I I think that it's 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 vital. I think you can't really do anything without involving the local community, and the only way you can understand whether you can in, you could involve the local community is by being part of it, um, right. and and seeing and and not necessarily trying to to shape it but to to see how it works right and you know i mean i i, I don't know I'm, unfortunately i i read just the other day uh, uh, about community involvement in setsi work mm -hmm. and which is where you would expect communities to to be heavily involved and they lost their interest it seems once, once the problem seems to go away, people seem to lose interest, and this yeah. may be one of the difficulties with, with, with malaria in the in the coming years. That if, right. if we really make a difference, then it will, it will, people will become less interested in it. That's an important point. Yeah, yeah, it's a responsibility the communities must take to continue having this interest. Um, thank for Derek. This is a picture of the Kilombero, um, much more recent than the time you were there. Uh, mm -hmm. Just for your information, then I have a bridge there. You I know, to, I've seen You used I to have... cross there with a canoe. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's not a very pretty bridge, is it? It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's quite ugly, unfortunately. Yes, I was thinking about this. I, I, I... Yes. They, they, they have a, a, a modern bridge there now. This is, this is a picture from the construction days of the mm -hmm. bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, but I put this up here and the, at the top left, there's a picture <coughs> of, uh, from one of your publications where you describe the distribution of adult stages of Anopheles Gambi and Anopheles Funestus. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the moment- In the dry season. In the dry season, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you see, and, and that, the fact that you say it's in the dry season means actually that, that adult uh, distribution is a very good reflection of the aquatic uh, distribution too. Um, 
and, and more recently, some of my colleagues uh, who are also on the call have gone back to this and looked at where exactly they are breeding. And at the bottom, you see some of the images that I'm sure you are used to, to, to doing that. I put this up here because I want us to reflect a little bit on the work that you have done in the Kilomero, which is considered now one of the best characterized transmission settings. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, if you look at that picture, I see perhaps your greatest contribution to mathematical modelers. This is page 96 of your latest book. Mm -hmm. and, and when you talk to mathematical modelers, I'm not sure if my colleague Samson Kiwari is on the call, but I hope so. Uh, uh, but when you talk to mathematical modelers, they almost always refer to some of the calculations that you made many, many years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, these were, and these were very difficult things to do. Calculations like the survival per day, the host seeking cycle length, the gonotrophic cycle length, incubation period. Who does this, Derek, in the field? And I guess for us, the question is, do you think that someone should do these assessments in more places or maybe redo them? Uh, well, you, if you actually do the... <clears throat> the basic entomology, then you can you can do them. Of course, uh, I have to say, of course, this was all Tom Smith's calculations, not my calculations, as I have pointed out. I can't. I'm uh, <coughs> uh, hardly able to to see uh, uh, that that the, the fieldwork was the, yours. The the, the yeah. mathematics was Tom's. So. Yes, except that, of course, let's say this. Uh, th there's one one that remains in a way one uh, question that is still up for grabs in in terms of the, the, all of this modeling and and stuff like that is how does does the mosquito senesce does it get the does, does survival rate depend on the age of the mosquito um you will see in this table here, you have this thing called PD, mm -hmm. which was um, a, a bit of serendipity that I had in, in Namuala, I think, in Namuala village, it's where so it, in the dry season, Arabiensis dropped from something like 3,000 or so a night in a light trap down to eight mosquitoes over a period of six weeks i think and the, the decline was uh, followed basically a, a straight line more or less we, we collected every day from just one house at that time uh this was jeffett's house in fact um Jeffett and, yeah mm -hmm. and 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 the numbers just followed a, a, a very much a, a, a straight line <clears throat> implying that, that survival was, in fact, exponential. It, it was age independent. But much of the data from dissections, it indicates that um, age, uh, that survival decreases with age. And so you get what's called a, a Gompertz curve. Um, however, coming back to the the work of, of dissections, I, I mentioned that the information that, that may be available in a, in a particular follicle or, or disappears once a mosquito lays an egg. And so perhaps a mosquito may be four parous, and for the first three cycles, a particular follicle did not develop. Mm -hmm. So that by the time it was three parous, you would see three dilatations. But the fourth time it developed eggs, all that information Disappear. disappears. And so what is, what is it, so that there are fewer and fewer ovarioles that never ever develop eggs under the, that kind of system. And so um, the, the, the the proportion that don't develop eggs is called the, the diagnostic index. How many of them 
are, are, are true, true, are you truly able to diagnose the, the age of the mosquito from? And the diagnostic index drops as the mosquito ages because of this, this process. And so it's quite possible that standard dissections um, do not do not uh, accurately reflect the the total number of of oviposition's that these very old yeah. mosquitoes have gone through, and the and the very old mosquitoes are the ones that will determine how how the in in many ways how how the slope changes at the after the mosquitoes laid egg six six seven eight times that you know you, once you get to eight nine ten times of Ovi position, you have to dissect thousands before you'll find a single mosquito that we, you, you can say, oh, this mosquito has laid eggs 10 times. Okay. You know, it becomes very difficult. Um, so that, that's where you will see. Do we have, um, I don't know, yeah, we, I think somewhere along the way, you, we had the, the, this other technique of, of determining it survival and that is the delayed oocyst rate this is something that that george davidson pioneered in right. the 1950s and 60s whereby you know that the the proportion of mosquitoes with sporozoites might be four percent mm -hmm. let's say in the wild so what happens if you catch some mosquitoes you've already got four percent of them with with sporozoites but you keep them alive and after uh, 10 days of being kept alive and molly coddled you get a sporozoite rate of 10 percent meaning that that those six percent extra are the ones that would normally have died in that time mm -hmm. and so that's a way of, of estimating survival rate that way uh, which I think we, we we also did. I mean, I think there, but you you will see that that, that in general, in general, and and Martin Burley has has made a comment on this that in general the daily survival rate of mosquitoes that are vectors is around eighty three percent. And is that standard for all the mosquito species? It it ha ha. It, it, it when well, this is is very much a kind of rule of thumb okay but it, it would seem that that in order to be a vector you need to you need to to have a, 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 re, a, a we all know you need to have a high survival rate and that, yeah. that survival rate is around 80 80 percent or so right. and yeah. when i've done other work elsewhere yeah. that that seems to be you know, generally the case that it's around 80%. Uh, so would you recommend that uh, these calculations are done after the age of uh, ITNs? The, the ones that we have seem to have been done all before we had mass interventions. Oh yes, yeah, sure, of course. Um, it, it makes a, 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 a makes sense to know how, how, how much of an effect you are, you are having. Um, uh, but of course, often you will do an entomological assessment um, based on on, a, on an intervention with a control, so that you're trying to see how how much of an effect your intervention is has, is having, rather than necessarily trying to get an, an absolute. Um, figure oh. right i see heather just shared uh, there uh, 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 someone already did this that's uh, more recent estimates yes well sure so i'm probably wrong <laughs> no, no, no problem <laughs> then it comes yeah. us to uh, move back to the field a little bit mm -hmm. um uh, at the top of that picture you see uh, something that i pulled out from your work in mozambique published in 2003 in Valeri at the bottom you see um, uh, some work from Southeastern Tanzania, um, 
this is the first evidence of uh, uh, Funesta swamps in, in Tanzania, and you have Funesta swamps up there in the north. And I want us to dwell a little bit, because your PhD was on the mating behavior of, 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 of malaria vectors. And, and I think one of the things that people struggle a lot with is this swamp behaviors, what their role is, where they are. And I, I want us to talk a little bit about this. Uh, first of all, why, is it, why are these things just so difficult to see? You spent a lot of time in Tanzania, and this, this is one of the, the areas that were fairly difficult to see. Uh, yeah, I, I, because of my PhD, I was always on the lookout for swarms in, in, um, when I was working in, in Tanzania. And I didn't see them. I, I remember on my notebook when we, we were doing a lot of resting collections. And so, you know, if ever I found a lot of males, I'd put a, a note in my, in my notebook saying, look for swarms. And I never found any. <laughs> I never yes. found any. In, when I was in when I was in in Tanzania, I never found any. Um, again, in, in, in Gillies and uh, of course, I did some field work when I was doing my PhD in in um, in the Gambia, which was the first time I went to 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 Africa. In fact, and I used to go down to the salt flats because Milas breeds in salt flats a long way from the the villages so so milas again is a mosquito that will have a a long flight range that we've right. been talking about and you know i i went down there many evenings at, at dusk and i i couldn't find them i couldn't find them and yet i could swear that they they were swarming around you know i felt that they were there and and it was it was only only by chance that i i one day realized that i was actually the marker for the swarm and so they were swarming on top of my over the on on top of me and so i was looking <laughs> for them all over all over the place and actually they were just on top of me and then once i I realized that and put down a few artificial markers um, that I was able to properly, properly study them. Uh, yeah. in, in, in Gilly's book, in those books, they say, oh, Fronesta swarms are much more difficult to find. Yeah. But in, in, in Mozambique, perhaps because of the high density of mosquitoes that we had there, yeah. They were, they were all over the place. Yeah, yeah they, we, 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 we were able, my colleague uh, Emmanuel Kandor is probably on the call. Of, I mean, you reviewed our uh, first description of Anopheles arabiensis swarms. Um, the, and I remember one of your comments was whether swarms are actually useful for mating. Um, we, we see now also Anopheles finesse swarms, they're very rare. Um, but you see the mosquitoes there. So, that's the question. Do you think, Derek, that mosquitoes mate inside houses? I I don't know. In the wild? Yeah, I don't think they do. I don't think they do. Um, certainly, I don't think for nest. No, I don't think they do. Uh, it, it, of course, it might depend on the on the on the house and on the illumination and all on all of this. But basically. <clears throat> When we, when, one of the things that we did in, in Mozambique was to do a lot of exit collections. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I really am a, a bear of small, little brain, as they would say, as Winnie the Pooh would say. I nurse, noticed when I was walking around the village, and this is one of the advantages of, of living in the village, is that you're there. You're actually there at sunset. You don't have to make a special trip. You're there. Um, so this this helps you a lot, uh, and I noticed that the mosquitoes were leaving houses at dusk, and in in excuse me in in Mozambique the 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 houses the walls of the houses reach um, uh, the, the gable ends of the houses are are have a big opening, not not the standard eaves along the side of the houses, but the ends. And you can see these mosquitoes leaving 
the houses by at the ends of the houses and i spent oh uh, a, a, a number of weeks thinking ah well okay what the mosquitoes are doing is is leaving their resting site flying tending to fly upwards mm -hmm. and then they're flying out of the house so i would stick a mosquito net over the house. end of the end of the house and catch the mosquitoes stand inside the net and catch the mosquitoes inside the net um and then i eventually realized that i was you know working far too hard and that it's much easier just to that, that it's not that the mosquitoes were flying upwards but that they were flying towards the lightest part of the house to leave it they become positively phototactic so that the the easiest way of collecting them was to just leave the door open and put a, a piece of netting over the door and then all the mosquitoes would come onto the netting in front of the door and you'd have somebody inside the house and they could then aspirate them That's it. Yeah. and the males would all come with extended antennal fibrilli so they would be ready to mate of course um and they you could have a a, a female very close to them coming at the same time uh, and so both would be be there and and maybe making enough noise for the male to kind of say oh look i can see there's a female but that there was never any attempt at mating by the male the the phototactic response was overriding anything else right right so i I'm, I'm you know maybe they'll mate if the house is is sealed and that sort of thing but then that's that's an interesting point yeah yeah i i i believe that they the phototactic response is 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 the main thing. Yeah, then, this is a this is a point that I would like us to uh, maybe later, not necessarily on this call, to discuss a little more because my colleagues in Ifakara have shown me some data that very very clearly suggests that at least if you seal the house, uh, the females do get insemination. Uh, uh, that 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 would be nice to to have a discussion. The point you raised about whether this can happen in a non sealed house is something that that's that's what what checking. But look at that data, Derek. Um, um, and I, this has nothing to do with mating. So we, we, I just want you to look at the number of male Anopheles fenestres you see in the house. And this is something I've seen in your published papers as well. Uh, very interesting behavior with Anopheles fenestres. You don't see a lot of that with other Anopheles. The idea that you find so many male mosquitoes inside the house. What do mm -hmm. you make of this? Uh, well, uh, again, it depends on the uh, probably on the on the proximity to the to the breeding site, so where the males have have emerged. But the the the, the males, I mean, they're they're a nice. They're, they'll fly towards mosquitoes. Will fly towards um, silhouettes, large silhouettes, which houses in fact produce yeah. and and i i at one time in when i was in in sao tome i had you could see mosquitoes flying in sao tome there's there's a lot of, of kaluzzi and they would rest outdoors at night right. and you could see them on a leaf in the morning and as soon as the the sun kind of would come up and and, and hit the mosquito it would be off and you mm -hmm. could see them fly towards the darkest thing that they could that you could see and that they presumably also could see so they they'll fly towards uh, uh, something that's that's dark uh, and that's that's in the shadow or what have you and that will be houses you know maybe in in Correct. many places for yeah. for fernestus for, for yeah you can see that that arabiensis really um is is not resting inside so many houses by any yeah. means um yeah because it's much more of a, a of a of an outdoor mosquito anyway gamby yeah. hmm, uh maybe maybe uh, gamby 
will will rest much more inside houses than than really you you have houses. argued in your in your writings that the idea that you have so many male fenesters inside houses makes anopheles fenesters even more susceptible to indoor residual spraying right? yeah yeah of course okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Derek, my colleagues asked me to ask you a, a side question mm -hmm. about about non-traditional uh, vector control. Mm -hmm. And one example they asked me to ask you about is spatial repellents. So in the picture you see there is an example of one format of spatial repellents. There are other formats that people te are testing around the world. This particular format is put around the house. Mm -hmm. the, que the, the question my colleagues have here is, what do you think um, are opportunities around this kind of interventions uh, going forward from a later control? Well, I, I, I sort of think that the, 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 the basic idea of malaria control and malaria control, not mosquito control, mm -hmm. but malaria control should be to prevent mosquitoes biting people. And if you have a, a mosquito, this is, so, let, let's say, if you have, um, in many places where you had Gamby, mm -hmm. or you, it, and you put in some kind of control inside the house, Gamby will, will drop and Arabiensis will start taking its place. Mm -hmm. And Arabiensis, as we all know, is a much less efficient vector than Gamby. And the same is true for Fenestus and the other members of the Fenestus group. Um, very often, Fenestus is replaced by Rivulorum. And, well, Rivulorum has been found with sporozoites, but it's not, you know, it's not really a vector. And Arabiensis is not nearly as efficient a vector as Gambi. And Arabiensis can be diverted to animals. So my own idea, my position would be, well, stop them biting people. Let them bite animals. Don't don't attempt to kill them all. I'm not talking about the Gambi or the Fenestus. I'm talking about the Arabiensis or the Rivulorum because they were previously um, suppressed by the Gambi or the Fenestus as larvae. Correct. And if you kill them, then you may be opening up once again that niche, the larval niche, to be reinvaded by whatever's left. And if you have, let's say, uh, a, a 10 to 1 Arabiensis larvae, then the, the one Gambi larvae may not be able to, to compete particularly successfully. But if you have right. a 1 to 1, then the Gambi may be able to supplant the, the Arabiensis. And you get a return to to Gambi, so that your 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 Arabiensis and your Rivulorum may be acting as as kind of um, uh, the biological control. Almost. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and so maybe you you should use your repellent just to stop the mosquito biting people and then use other techniques like zooprophylaxis to maintain that population but uh, that is not uh, likely to bite people if you can move the mosquitoes away from biting people then you you're in a position whereby your malaria will certainly reduce to levels at which other anti-malarial interventions such as a suitable treatment right that's an interesting and proposition uh, derek that we should be that, that we should consider using the less 
efficient vectors like Anopheles revolurum and Anopheles arabiensis as biological controls for the more efficient vectors like Anopheles gambiensis and Anopheles funestis? Well, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> Is that what you say? Uh, that's 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 what I'm saying. I'm saying that you 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 know that to say oh Arabiensis is also a vector, so you have a, a knee jerk response to try and um, kill it may may not be the be the best thing. If you can get a, a an Arabiensis population that is let's say supposing it it's eighty percent zoophilic, well if by pushing it a little bit away from people, you make it 90, 95% zoophilic, you of course, you may not be reducing the, the numbers of mosquitoes because let's say zoo prophylaxis is, is, doesn't actually reduce the number of mosquitoes, but you may be reducing transmission. And at the end of the day, it's transmission that you want to reduce. Yes. Is this idea described? Uh, have you described this before? This, I'm, I'm hearing this for the first time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I find it very intriguing. Yeah, yeah, it's the first time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah, you, you yeah, it, yeah, yeah. That you should focus your killing, your toxicity towards the more efficient anthropophilic venture species and the divergence towards the less anthropophilic, the more zoophilic vector species and in this way you use them as a biological control for the real vector. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it, it sort of calls into question how, how useful some techniques that may well work okay. are, are, like toxic sugar baits outdoors. You're, you're actually killing a mosquito that's feeding on sugar that isn't necessarily doing you any harm and and you know well you know i don't want to kill a mosquito that's not doing me any harm or not doing my dog any harm or my cow any harm um i i the same with ivermectin you know you you can feed ivermectin to to cows in order to kill mosquitoes now ivermectin of course has has many benefits uh, but it, it may actually have a k kill more zoo yeah. animal yeah. feeding mosquitoes that and so trend tend towards to push the mosquitoes to towards people still um, i think that those approaches are irresponsible in a way ecologically mm -hmm. yeah okay wow uh, this is uh, the such quite a lesson for me uh, uh sarah just said anophilism without malaria i guess uh, yes yeah, part yeah. of the story yeah, yeah. yeah, Derek, yeah well, let's uh move on now we're gonna, i'm going to try and rush move this a little faster now but, but that's that's mm -hmm. fine that's this is a, a fantastic schematic um uh, from my colleague uh, samson kiware um uh, describing um uh, we had an original version of this uh, in a publication in 2010 uh, that heather ferguson and dr jerry killing uh, did write uh, this is the uh, uh, updated version of it and it describes many of the non life cycle processes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and i am sure you've looked at this a lot because you you actually copy you have a copy of this in your in your yeah, own i book. do indeed yes. yes it's very useful mm -hmm. yes yes from a, a human perspective and also a vector control perspective where do you think we are not putting enough effort right now in which of those stages I, I, I think that we have uh, lost, and I, I'm guilty of this uh, more, more than anybody, I suppose. I think that we've lost a, a, a considerable understanding of the, the larval stage in the mosquito. I think we, we, we know less about the mosquito larvae these days yeah. than, than they did in the Gillies and, and Wilkes time. Um, and, and not necessarily for control, but let's say, as we've just discussed, normally if you have Gambi and Arabiensis, they, they, they share many characteristics of, this, of the breeding site. And so they will compete with each other. 
what are the factors that might enable you to to um, sort of push competition towards the the, the non vector is is one so that you can get a kind of natural sustainable control and um, and I think we we know very little about mosquito larvae. I think part of that is because it's much more difficult to to obtain a replica, replicable sample of mosquito larvae than it is for adults. You know, with an adult, you can put up a light trap, uh, and as long as it's in the, a, a consistent place in the room, yes, yes. You, you'll you'll get a consistent proportion of the population that you'll you'll collect, and so you can see changes more 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 rapidly those the numbers that you get may not reflect exposure but then i don't think that really any method that we have at the moment accurately reflects exposure it, yeah. uh, human landing collections don't reflect a normal person's exposure you know okay. people go to bed uh, yeah. put a cover on them sleep under a net not yeah sitting out at night trying to catch mosquitoes and do things like that. So um, I, I think larvae is a, is a big thing. Obviously, a, a, another, another aspect is, is sugar feeding. I, I, in, in, in Sao Tome, I don't, you know, the mosquitoes, I don't think really fed on sugar at all. I never found any mosquito with a, a, a crop full of sugar. And again, the mosquitoes always tended to return immediately after, uh, after every position. So, that's, that's a very bold uh, statement, uh, Derek. You well, never well, found <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I never found. I'm not saying <laughs> they don't do it. I say I never found it. I that's never interesting. Found it. Right. So, uh, and, and that's why I say, look, you need to look at it a bit more because yes. um, it, it, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's really understudied how, how much sugar feeding, what are the, what are the, uh, um, you know, you've got, uh, what are the, what are the, the, the plants that these mosquitoes might feed on if they do feed on sugar, what are they, what are they, how how can you how could you use that you know what are the seasonal effects of right. of different plants because in in you know the plants have their their seasons of producing um right. nectar and things like this um what what what's really going on there um are the mosquitoes actually doing any good you know a lot of pollination is done by flies not necessarily mosquitoes, but by flies, other than not just bees always. So, uh, are 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 they are they actually at all useful? I have no idea. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, uh, there's that. And then, of course, you you also have the 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 thing of of yeah, how much house structure, as you just we just saw that that graph. Yeah, uh, uh, of of Stop indoor resting by yeah. by Fenestus. Um How much does that affect? Does that affect? I I, I want yeah, to yeah. hold to hold that thought about house structure because because I, I have in the next uh, few minutes we want to ask you a, a, a little bit about it. So I'm gonna kindly request that you just hold that, and instead. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't mind, uh, I know you said earlier that you do not like mathematics, and you can forget about the mathematics part of this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the commonest phrases in medical entomology is vectoral capacity. Mm -hmm. What is the simplest way to describe vectoral capacity? It, as, as a practicing medical entomologist. What do you mean? How to define it? or How or... would you describe it to, to you know, a student class. Well, it, 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 but, but basically, it's the ability. Uh, that it, it's the, in in many ways, it's the un. 
unrealized potential of the mosquito to transmit malaria. Okay. Does that make sense? The unrealized yeah. potential of the mosquito to transmit malaria. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's it, the, the, the mosquito will transmit malaria uh, only if it feeds on somebody who has gametocytes. Mm -hmm. But um, the mosquito might be able to transmit malaria or might not be able to transmit malaria, largely based on its ecology, its survival, its feeding frequency, and its host preference, as well, of course, as the innate ability to, to develop the parasite. So right. that if, you, if you have, uh, uh, and it's, it's where knowing the vectorial capacity is perhaps important where you are reducing the amount of malaria transmission. Are you actually reducing the, the ability of the mosquito to transmit its vectorial capacity? Or is it due to some other factors like a reduction in the um, infectious reservoir, which is affecting people. the transmission? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's that's the kind of why vectorial capacity in itself yeah. is is perhaps yeah. a useful measure. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that when as part of this master classes, uh, I will be able to speak to uh, uh, Tom Smith and maybe Dave Smith as well. Uh, one of the questions I want to ask them is the linkage between vectorial capacity and the the R naught for malaria. Mm -hmm. uh, how those how those how those link but uh, well well r naught for malaria is it, <laughs> it tom will tell you this uh that he, because he's produced a written a paper on on r naught and and malaria i i think that r naught in malaria is only a useful indicator where you um where you have epidemics okay uh, r naught it implies that there is no immunity in the population. Mm -hmm. And in, course, in many cases, especially where there's intense amount of malaria transmission, then you might essentially have, in theory, a very high R0. But in practice, what I think they call RC, R little C, it is about one, so that the, the, the likelihood of transmission of, a, from a, of an infective bite is much lower than, than, the, than the essential R0, because the mosquito is feeding on somebody who is already immune. Right. Uh, and so that will not it be, be result in transmission. But in an epidemic situation, you have people who are not immune, and then, yeah, every infectious bite gives rise to an infection in the in the human host. Um, I'm sure Tom will tell you about that if he if he manages. <laughs> it's it's, to it's a concept we want to we want to understand more about because I think it's, it's very important one also for the control. But I like the, the 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 description you provided earlier, which is how do we reduce the ability of the mosquito to transmit malaria, and then the idea that they are no might are not might be more applicable for the case of uh, epidemics uh, and that we must be focusing on the RC. And I, again, I'm gonna just gonna ask if we have specialists on the, on the line who want to clarify this. Uh, I'm not sure, for example, if Samson is on the line, you could just send a text message there either, uh, to, to help us clarify the dis as we move on with the discussion. Uh, Derek, I've asked you this already before, in your opinion, uh, you, you've asked, partially, but as a, as a young researcher, I'm not young anymore, but as, as researchers working in 2020s and above, what do you think we should be focusing more on going forward? Key research questions. Well, uh, I say that you, you asked me this in a way about- Yeah, I, the, I did. The, the, the question about should we be looking at, at the, the, the ecology of, of, of larvae. Um, right. I, again, in, in some ways, the, the, 
malaria uh, is a nexus of it's a web and humans uh, are an important part of that web and so uh, I, I sort of think that it would be really very useful if the the the, the people who actually get the disease and who are exposed to mosquitoes can be a lot more involved in in trying to tackle some of the the problems that they face uh, and and so th there's not let's say one overarching research question i don't think uh, yeah. but you know i i i tend to think of uh, my my ap approach is very much you know let's say you show me a, a slide there of, of these houses by the river well the first thing that i would do is is not say oh well i've got a research question i i would want to see what their exposure is and what they what they do about it um yeah. i i say how it how to get communities involved in um not just control, but also uh, research and understanding of of disease would be an of, of, of the entomology is like perhaps a little holy grail or, or what have you. That I I'm I'm let's say I think that using mobile phones, smartphones as a as a as a research tool is important because anybody can use them right and and so in in europe you have a situation where somebody can have a mosquito either on the wall of their house or that lands on them and and tries to feed on yeah. them and they can take a picture of that mosquito and send it off and that mosquito can be identified and uh, they also send their geographical reference of course when they when they with their phone so let's say uh one of the one of the potential problems of that that may face the the african sub subcontinent is anopheles stevens eye and this is a mosquito that will be very difficult to monitor very difficult to you know you 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 have to you have to do a lot of of searching of negative results you have right. to you can't you can't wait until you find it you have to be looking for it before you find it Derek, you worked uh, in a, you worked in eritrea uh, a lot um, in the Horn of Africa, um, <coughs> should we worry about an awful Stephens eye? Well, I mean, it's there in Djibouti, it's there in Sudan. Um, it's not been reported, and I didn't see it in, in Eritrea. And I, I suspect that Eritrea might be, um, might avoid getting Stephen's eye because the only town that that might possibly have it is a long way from anywhere that's okay. Masawa and okay. and it they don't have you know they don't have very much communication there's okay. not much communication between Sudan and, and Eritrea or Djibouti and Eritrea they're almost you know at war with each other so um, uh, they 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 may not get it but it it really depends on looking at at kind of things like trade routes uh, and things like this that to see oh the ships from Djibouti go down to Dar es Salaam let's say to to drop right. off or pick up stuff um, but if they go down to drop things off then at one time you're likely to get um, Stephen's eye invading Dar es Salaam well that's a, you know that that could be a very serious problem uh, because they're so much more difficult to to control 
You, know, you right. can't. They, they they spread like like Edie's is much more difficult to control than right. Anopheles. Oh, on the slide there, you have Anopheles shipping sir. I was going to ask you this question actually, so it's good that you it's good that you <laughs> that you, you answered it. Yeah, um, yeah, we should be looking. We should be uh, doing some. Uh, 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 but but one way one way that you can look more effectively is is to have a a, a, a system whereby people can you know the, the Joe Blow in the street can 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 take a picture and report. Look, there's this mosquito biting me, and right. and they can see. Oh yeah, this is an an Edes aegypti. This is a oh yeah. this is you know focus take, focus on the front. Oh, it's a an albitarsis or or what have you. Um, yeah. And, and if you find if you find in the middle of Dar es Salaam that you've got an, an Anopheles, then that's when uh, warning bells can be can be rung and and a team can go out and look for it. Thank um, you. Yeah. But you know, and it's it's a way of spreading the information. Right. If you like. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, I mean, this is, and I'm glad uh, my colleagues working in the city, uh, Nico Govella and team, they are on the call as well. And, and uh, um, Sarah Moe has got some interest around this area as well. And I think it's it's crucial that we are looking, uh, as you say, in the trade routes, in the big cities, uh, perhaps in Zanzibar as well. Um, and, and that this is good. Derek, you already talked quite a lot about public authorities and the need that they engage communities. And uh, at the bottom is my colleague, Lena Finder, doing some work with the villages, with the mm -hmm. locals there. Um, uh, incredible work, and we completely agree with you about this. Uh, you, I know you've already highlighted this, but you can take a minute just to really talk about the strengths of such work and, and what you think are some of the challenges. Well, the, the, the strengths, of this work is that without it, it you, you won't get any, you won't, it won't work. Um, right. Although uh, the, I, I think it was Marcel Proust who, who said, pain, we obey. Uh, uh, and so it- Pain, we obey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pain, we obey. So yes. you, you, you kind of, you need, but you need to know what uh, you what you are what you are, i think there's a, a big difficulty in making sure that people realize that science and this is true of 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 all science but it's you know any particularly public health science is that there's always going to be a degree of uncertainty involved in what you say yeah, there's always going to be a, a degree of uncertainty. So that it, 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 let's say in the in the in the present pandemic, scientists have been guilty of, of perhaps downplaying the degree of uncertainty. So that uh, let's say the use of masks has a has a is not you don't absolutely know the effect. You can be just reasonably sure reasonably sure that they are useful and it's the same with malaria control strategies that um, we can be reasonably sure that sleeping under a mosquito net is going to reduce the chances of you getting malaria from a mosquito that bites at night but it will not necessarily eliminate the chance of you getting malaria uh, but as long as people kind of understand that, then they make the choice. Oh yes, I will sleep under my net because it does not. It will get rid of malaria, but it will it will help me reduce the chances of it. You know, I had a vaccine for flu the other day. It won't get rid of my. You know, it's only forty five percent effective this year, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so it will probably half the chance of my getting flu, yeah. uh, do, which is good. You know. Do you think? Do you think malaria will be eliminated? Hmm. Is it worth even talking about? Uh, 
Well, there's there's a, a, a Lancet commission that says, you know, you really have to think that you can okay. eliminate malaria. Uh, and the, and the, 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 the thing changes in the sense that I think you, 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 you can't eliminate malaria by doing mosquito control as we are doing it now. You can control malaria that way, but I, I like to think of it as malaria control is like picking up the rubbish. <laughs> if, you're, if you're continuing to pick up the rubbish, the rubbish will still, if you, if you stop picking up the rubbish, the malaria, the, 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 the rubbish will accumulate. But you right. keep it. And then once you get down to a, 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 a lower level of, of transmission, then your malaria control agency and the people responsible for it become much more like firemen going to put out fires so that you, you, you need, you know, your focus becomes where are the foci of, of malaria? What is a, 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 a hot spot of transmission? One right. case is a, is a hot spot. It's a hot spot, right. In, in particular, it becomes very, very important once you reduce transmission to low levels for a long time. You know, supposing, yeah. supposing you reduce transmission to very low levels, almost elimination for a period of, of three years or so. Yeah. You have to then be extremely careful because of this thing that, that we discussed a little bit before. R naught, R C becomes R naught and and you get wildfire, you know, yeah. and, and it becomes out of control. So your fireman yes. team cannot control it. Do that. And it yeah. and it burns everywhere. Um, which is what happened in Sao Tome in the, I think it was what, uh, not, not so many years ago, uh, in the late 70s or so. They controlled it. And they, did, they used to IRS, right? They used IRS and chloroquine. And right. they basically uh, more or less eliminated malaria. And then somebody came in with, a, well, people, first of all, started refusing to have their houses sprayed. Because it was killing the cats, killing the, the cats. cats. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and the cats were keeping the rats down, of course. So they then had a, a big problem with rats, and and things like that. So they they were refusing, to, and then somebody came in with a a, a chloroquine resistant strain of falciparum from probably from Angola, I think, and bam, you have a, an outbreak of malaria that meant that Sao Tome was considered by the Guinness Book of Records to be in the, the millennium edition anyway, to be the most dangerous place in the world um, because, because there was so much malaria there and well, people were dying because they didn't yeah. really, you know, doctors yeah. had no longer yeah. knew how to treat it and all of that. Um, I was, I was going to ask you actually about, um, so, and we're drawing towards a close. We, we, we've done two hours already, which is fantastic. Wow. But <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, brilliant. Uh, I will skip skip this, but I want to ask you something very, very dear to us, which was the, the beginning of our conversation. Derek, do you worry about uh, do you worry about the loss of professional medical entomologists? Oh, you've got loads of really good professional medical entomologists in Ifakara, haven't you? <laughs> in Ifakara, in Ifakara, yes. Yeah, in Ifakara, I think Ifakara is a, is, a, is a shining light. Um, Thank you. Thanks for that. I, 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 I think that, yes, I, I think what is perhaps happening and, uh, is, is that there is the, the likelihood of a, a transition from the the standard and uh, medical entomological techniques to to more laboratory based ones which may be valid but which do not which which, which obviously require kind of field based validation yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's a window of opportunity that that may well be being lost because uh, there's there's you know a few uh, many of them are are, are are old people who worked from Europe or the states in Africa or Brazil or or and and who like you know the number of people that I've trained it is is really quite small it's not it's not uh, sufficient I don't think um, and so yeah I think there's a there there is a a a, a loss there that that right. needs kind of a little bit but maybe not forever you know it may not be something that that is required for the next hundred years but over the next five ten years it it would it, something needs to 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 improve yeah. perhaps you know i mean it's it's ridiculous that that there aren't more people who can just sit down and and dissect a mosquito let's say which is you know um thanks uh, yeah what were the highlights of my career in asia eating durian maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have, we have we have durian in Zanzibar as well. It smells oh, quite, quite nice. Oh, yeah. well, it doesn't smell nice. It's like a good cheese. It's like a good cheese. You don't. Yeah. You have to eat a nice durian, and it's very nice. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I I you know they they I, in Cambodia. I I found it very hard to to work in Cambodia. Um, I think that in Cambodia, the, the Cambodians are committing suicide. And it was, I think that they are destroying their environment as fast as they possibly can. And by doing so... It's deforestation, right? Deforestation, yeah. So I lived in, in, in the woods and in the village uh, in Mondolkiri, one of the places where there is still forest and you know the only thing you could hear every day was a chainsaw wow. uh, and the only thing you could see and at night you'd see one night you have the the policeman come by and stay in the village and they'd all sit and drink and then the next night you know a, 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 a convoy of motorbikes carrying out huge logs sawn logs would go through the village um, because the policeman had got his little bit of backsheesh. Um, so that was that. I, I don't think that we really um, solved any problems in, yeah. in, in Cambodia. We did a, the, the, the idea was to try and to work out ways to prevent people who might be going into the forest to reduce the likelihood of their getting malaria because their yeah. Anopheles dirus is the vector and it's very much a, a forest-based mosquito. Indeed, yeah, a, we, we have um, um, an, another question that my colleagues had asked me to put to you is uh, in relation to the climate change and uh, human activities. So it's, it's something that I'm going to ask you as a last, last minute, uh, Derek, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, but f first I want us to uh, close by this deep entomology section uh, mm -hmm. by just have been uh, using this picture uh, from the Kilombero. Uh, and you mentioned it earlier as well. And I guess the question here is, you know, we, we have bed nets, yes. Uh, we can do uh, spraying, we can do lots of other things. When you see a uh, housing structures such as this, um, uh, what do you think needs to be done for disease control. Um, well, <laughs> and is it even worth going forward? I I look at this house and I think, well, this house is actually not too bad. Mm -hmm. It's got a, a decent door, it looks like, because um, it's got the, a proper door frame. Because in in Mozambique, the one of the difficulties was that um, you could try and 
prevent mosquitoes coming in through the, 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 the gable ends by using old mosquito nets. So, of right. course, one of the things, and coming back to, to the, the question about in, involving communities, is if, if they've got an old mosquito net, they might use it for their, their, their keeping their chickens or, or, or protecting their plants. But the first thing they could do is to cover the eave gap with the with the net which yeah. is very easy to do tear it up into strips and and that reduces house entry rates quite considerably um we did some of that work in in mozambique made a made a big difference but in mozambique the difficulty was that the doors were all awful they were they were they were badly badly fitting so Right. It's a little bit like if you have a, a, a bag and you blow it up and so you've got all this host odor in the bag and then you've got a tiny gap, yes. then the mosquitoes will come to it and will find it and will get in that way. Um, yeah. and, and in, in, but this, this house, I mean, I, you see you have a kitchen here. I presume that's yeah. a kitchen yeah. Yeah. to the left. Um, so... Uh, maybe the, the, the trying to to seal the house from mosquitoes not necessarily to seal the house from from air movement brilliant because Thanks. people don't necessarily want to to seal a house and make it too stuffy for themselves um this this house you see, it looks like it's, I say, it's not bad. It looks like it's got screen on the windows. Yes. Well, that's yeah. also not a, 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 you know, that's good. Not, again, in, in Mozambique, houses don't have windows. Most houses don't have windows because they're quite small. And they, this, it, this gable gap is enough of a window to give light in the house anyway. So um, one thing that, that, that makes a big difference, of course, <laughs> is uh, electricity. Right. And, and in many places, and, and communication. So communication meaning roads. Because when you've got roads, you can have electricity. Or you can have a, in a, in a place like this, you can have a, a, a solar panel. So it's not directly it's not a, a direct uh, anti-vector or, or malaria control. Effect. Sure, but it improves livelihood. It improves life. Yeah. And by doing so, um, it, it should perhaps reduce the likelihood of being bitten by a mosquito. Uh, and, and, that, and that brings us to, to this, which is at the moment, um, the way funding for malaria research or control is forecast is, is assumes, uh, assumes this uh, idea that you can deal with malaria as a separate, as a standalone disease. Uh, but you're talking very much livelihoods here. And my colleagues would like to know uh, whether you have any advice to people with the money, uh, how, how should they spend this? Uh, one of the, one of the, <laughs> yeah, I, I have no, no I'm not, why, one of the one of the problems I think with with research funding at the present time, and I, I you know I don't know how you get around this, is that it's as much uh, administrative uh, uh, a problem to control and and to organise a small grant as it is a large grant. So. You know, all these big funders like the Gates and things, they'd much rather give out a uh, you know, $5 million grant to somebody than uh, a $5,000 grant because the amount of administration is more or less the same. But for the research worker, obviously, you can say, oh, well, having $5 million is, is much more than more useful than having 5000 But it, I, I believe it kind of shifts the 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 focus if you like of 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 people's thinking on what what they want to do i think i think uh, 
let's say the other day I, I was thinking about uh, mobile phones. Well, if you are a, a research worker in a place where there were a lot of mosquitoes that you can collect resting inside houses, let's say, well, maybe you should try and have develop a, <clears throat> a, a, a system whereby which attracts mosquitoes to rest in a particular place so that the householder can then take a photograph on their phone of that particular site maybe it's a you know piece of a painted sandpaper or something that they that the mosquitoes will like to rest on or in a place that they're in you know, down in the corner or something like that so that so that then you have that easy to distribute lots of these so that you can get a large scale um sample but it won't you know it won't cost to yeah. develop it to develop some something like that is 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 peanuts it's not so you're saying there's this value in small grants i i certainly think there is yes i Thank certainly you. think there is i th i certainly think that for particularly for for young researchers you know people who 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 are either about to do a PhD or just got a degree or something, then a, a, a small grant gives them an, not just the, the ability to do a, a, a small piece of work, but also the, the self-esteem that comes from it, yeah. rather than just being a bit player, a bit player in a very large grant. Oh. And most of these large grants are given to what you call northern institutions, you know, the Liverpool School, the London School, and things like this. And so yeah. I, I think that sort of also continues, even with the best will in the world, it continues a, a, a system in which, you know, the, 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 the important, big, the grant holder, the PI, comes in, and and stays for a little while in the field and you know tries to walk around the village and do all of this but is there for a couple of weeks and otherwise stays <laughs> yeah. in, in a in a fancy hotel and then goes back to to europe to to you know analyze all the data and to write to write a nature paper and and it i think it gives the wrong yeah it's a goal that people say, oh, I want to be like that. Yeah. I think that's the wrong, particularly, you know, the, with, the, with, the, with climate change. You know, I don't think we can, I don't think we can do all this flying around and all this sort of stuff. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah. Derek, Derek, do you have a... Um, um, that I just saying there, um, uh, emphasizing the point on small grants for young scientists. Uh, Derek, have you had any mentors in your life? Well, Tony Wilkes, I guess, and yeah, Tony it was, and, uh, go ahead. Uh, basically, it was, uh, yeah. You you can learn from anybody. You can learn from anybody. Uh, not necessarily my my mentorship. So a mentorship being somebody who, who really took an interest and, and tried to bring you along. Um, it was, I guess it's really only been um, when I was do, actually doing my PhD. Because after that, I, I've been on my own. You know, I, that's one, one thing that, that in a way I, I sort of sometimes... It can, can regret is that I've I've rarely I've often been working yeah. in institutions where there there are no other people working on the same subject as me, um, so yeah. Uh, yeah yeah I mean uh, I mean like I said earlier God rest Tony's soul in peace I, I um, it's unfortunate what has happened in twenty twenty but um, uh, let's 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 uh, let's leave that. Um, last point, one to last point. What mm -hmm. piece of advice would you give to people starting their career? 
What piece? Well, <laughs> why not uh, uh, yeah, yeah, have faith. Have faith. faith. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, really, uh, that that that. Um, I mean, uh, let's say, don't 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 worry about particular career advancement. Don't worry about that. I wouldn't. I mean, look, when I went to Cambodia, when I started my my work as a doing my PhD, I was a research assistant uh, rather rather than just a phd student i was a, i was a, a research assistant when i went to cambodia in 2012 i think so many years later i'd gone up the ladder and was then a senior research assistant so you know it took me maybe 40, 30 years to become, to go from one, from a research assistant to a senior research assistant. But, you know, had a, yeah. a few. A you're, you're, still, you're still the greatest in this business. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't but matter. It, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't, I, w I, I mean, I think it's, uh, and, and yeah, when I was, when I was, uh, there was really no there was there still wasn't much of a of a career structure so i've had to uh, in in the time that i've been working at it's i spent maybe what five years working without actually getting any pay uh, wow. over the whole time that i that's why i still need a job um <laughs> it, it's it wasn't it wasn't easy it wasn't easy uh, and yeah. I almost gave up at one point after two and two and a bit years of of not having a job as an entomologist. Um, wow. and, uh, but so you you have to have faith, and and I, I mean I think that that science is not really a, a career or a job. I think it's more of a vocation. I think you want to find you're looking for the truth, uh, and yeah. this is what I I you know one searches for it, but you have you, faith, yeah, have faith, have faith. Yeah. Don't give up, yeah. Eric. Yeah. It's been incredible having this conversation with you. <laughs> we well, are we are super grateful. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. I hope it's been. Uh, it's been delight. I don't know about my colleagues, but. I mean, I will, I will unmute a few people if they want to just, you know, you can unmute yourself and, and just say something if you think so, or write a chat message for Derek. But personally, I found this incredibly useful. Um, uh, thank you so much, Derek. Do, do you have any, any, any particular thing you want to say at the end? Or, or, um... well, here's to 2021, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I, 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 yes, I, I personally am, am, I see in, certainly in Mozambique, I see it, that, that we really cannot take the foot off the gas in relation to trying to alleviate climate change. I'm, I'm, right. I'm very, very worried about that. Climate yeah. change and loss of, of biodiversity, basically. Um, right. It's like, when I was working in Ifakara, uh, uh, and I would take people to, I'd been there for a, a couple of years, and on the way to Ideti, and, and past Ideti, there was a lot of charcoal being made. And you could see the, the, the loss of, of trees as a result of the, the charcoal being made. And I remember people coming with me and um, saying, oh, this is wonderful. This is really beautiful on the, on the way there. And, and I would look at it and think, you didn't see what it was like before. You know? um, and in the same way, in the, in the Kilombero, the last time I was there and I went down, uh, downstream on, in, a, in a canoe with my friends, um, Comba and, and Joseph, the only animal 
the only animal that we saw were cows. Whereas previously we'd seen Cheshire, um, uh, elephants, uh, buffalo, yeah. nothing, nothing, only cows. And, and I think we have to be very careful about all this. this. It, it, it goes, you know, Joni Mitchell sings, don't it always seem to go when you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, worry. I'm, I'm, I worry. And we should worry too, Derek. Um, we should worry too. I'm glad you brought that back up, um, uh, the climate change issue. Uh, and actually, it aligns very well with some of the comments you're making about, about how to sustainably control malaria. It shouldn't always be about killing something. But at the same time, I think uh, what, taking care of the environment, the animals, uh, the water systems uh, sure. should be part of, part of the, the package. Thank you so much. Yes. My um, pleasure. My pleasure. Um, we're going to say thank you. And uh, you probably noticed that the conversation was being recorded. So I will try and share with you a copy of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, I just want to say a big, big thank you. And as you can see from, from the notes from my colleagues, uh, lots of um, uh, great messages um, uh, for you. And uh, from me as well, it's been a lovely uh, conversation. And I just want to... Again, if you have any suggestion on who I can talk to on this kind of subject, it's something that we want to keep discussing more because we think it's very, very important. This afternoon, oh, yeah. we are going to have a, a talk from one of my colleagues on ADC Egypt Eye Control um, in, in Tanzania. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it helps us a lot that we are able to speak to persons like you. Uh, uh, to get these experiences. So again, from me, Derek, thank you so, so much. And I do hope that you're staying safe from the coronavirus. I am and yes. ho hopefully you are able to get back to Ifakara yeah. and we can look yeah. for some dwarf, nice. dwarf ovarios. Yeah, why not? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We'll exchange my, my email. I sent you. And, okay. Uh, Bye. Okay. Very Bye -bye. good. Bye.